to, uh, to be saddened and, uh, by the sudden loss of Stephen Walker's uh, mother this past week, and we would ask you to continue to, to pray for them, pray for Stephen and his family during this difficult time. Uh, in his absence this morning, um, after our scripture reading, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. Um, it's not my first time listening, waiting to listen to words of wisdom from him. Um, so, uh, but we're happy that uh, my father, Charlie Morris, is, is here and willing to speak to us this morning. So, um, After you have had children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, if you then become corrupt and make any kind of idol, doing evil in the eyes of your Lord, your God, and arousing his anger, I call the heavens and the earth and as witnesses against you this day that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You will not live there long, but will certainly be destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and only a few of you will survive among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. There you will worship man-made gods of wood, and, of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. But if, you, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him, him if you seek him with all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in later days you will return to the Lord your God and obey him. For the Lord your God is merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. I just about got ahead of myself. There is a voice missing this morning. It's the voice that would walk up here and look at you and say, Good morning, church. And we're going to take a moment and pause. Let's have prayer for the Walker family. Our Father, we pause now to know that you care for those who grieve. We pray your blessings, your comfort, your peace with the Walker family. Be with us also, Father, as we think together this morning about the voices we hear and the voices that can distract us and the voices that can lift us up. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Moses was quite a guy. Now, we know him as the lawgiver. We know him as a profound teacher. And he's described at the end of the book of Deuteronomy as a prophet without equal to that time. The book of Deuteronomy captures his last days on earth and tells us about his final message, which is most of the book of Deuteronomy, to his people. And he had a lot to say. It's important to note that he said to them, you know, you're going to be given this promised land, and it's a great place. And you are going to forfeit it. He didn't use the word forfeit. He said you're going to become unfaithful. God's going to remove you. And after you have gone with your generations here, and you've been lost, at some point, you're going to hear the voice of God and turn to him, and he'll take care of you. What a, what a message of vision what a message of, of uh, hope. Uh, it seemed so true that they listened to other voices and then finally would hear God's voice and he would take care of them. You know, we're pretty used to hearing two voices. Um, by, the child, by the time a child's three or four years old, what have they learned? Well, they've learned that if they don't like the answer they get from mom, they go to dad. So they keep hunting that other voice, the voice they like. By the time they're in middle school, pushing on into high school, there's the voice of mom and dad. 
And then there's the, the voice of their peers, drawing them, sometimes it seems, in two different directions. Kind of true of all of us. We hear more than one voice. The uh, play, The Death of a Salesman, captures that so well with the story of a, of a man named Willie Loman. Willie Loman was a good guy. Uh, he was, had, a, he was, had a family. But his life seemed to be drifting a bit. And he didn't really like his job, but he tolerated it. He didn't really like his life too well. But he kept getting drawn between the voice that says, you need to be this, and you are going to be this. Well, well, he's a salesman, and he has to go off to New York. And in New York, he has decided that he's going to have an affair. And so he is drawn into an affair right there in the city. At the same time, his family decides to come to New York and to honor him. It's time to pay him a surprise visit. And he is caught because the two voices in his world are colliding. And that is a recipe for disaster. When those worlds collide. And so what did Willie do? Well, the play describes that as the day, the, the death of a salesman. Now, he wasn't physically buried for many years, but he died because he was caught with the two voices from different camps that came together and collided in his world. Which kind of makes me wonder, uh, how many voices are we listening to? How many voices do you hear? I'm reminded of a, of a lady that I know very well, and she's a pretty funny lady. She had to have some elective surgery, and it was pretty serious, and before she could have the surgery, she had to go see a psychiatrist to say, is it okay, and, and you know, is she prepared for this? And she's talking to the psychiatrist, and he says, do you hear voices that no one else hears? And she responded, No. <laughs> you ever hear those voices? Ultimately, for things that matter, there are two voices. We sometimes call it the voice of the world. The world is calling us. Just imagine, if you would, that... Um, we can imagine that if it matters, it's the voice of Satan. And we have the voice of Satan, and we have the voice of God. And we're caught as to which voice we listen to and which voice we speak with. And so for a few minutes this morning, we're going to take a little bit of time and listen to the voice of the world and we're going to listen to the voice from God. The voice is ours to choose. Do we speak with the voice of the Lord, or do we speak with the voice of the world? I just wonder, who's in charge? I want to be in charge of me. You know, they've got this self-help book, down at the bookstore, they advertise it. I hear it's good. And it tells me I can be in charge of my life. It puts me in charge. And I like the sound of that. I'm tired of everybody else being in charge of me. I am going to buy that book and take charge of my life. Or there's the voice that simply said, The Lord is my shepherd. There's the voice that says, 
there's a lot of things that I want and actually need. This old car of mine is not running so good. The house is getting a little raggedy, and I need to, I need a bigger one. You know, uh, I deserve better than I have. And what's so wrong with me getting more? Is that so bad? But then, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then there's the voice. Pills, pills, and more pills. Maybe they'll calm me down. My nerves are shot. My life is full of noise every day. It's the noise that I can't get rid of. The kids, the phone, the boss, my mother, my mother-in-law. There's so many people trying to take hold of me. I have to be something different. Well, there's the voice that says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. There's a commercial. I'm going to start it, and you'll finish it. What happens in Vegas, I wonder, I guess you've been listening to the voice of the world. You know, the voice that says, i got to get away. I've got to do something differently. I'm exhausted. I need my batteries recharged. And the world is offering me fun and excitement. Maybe some safe sin. Maybe a change of pace from where I am. There's the voice that says, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. There's a voice that says, What a mess I'm in. My life is just not good. You know, it's, uh, it's just not possible for me to have a better life. The good life is for somebody else. There's other people, all those church people that I go with to church, they've got it together. I wish I could be like the people I go to church with. And there's people probably here this morning who look around the room and say, look at all these good people. And I can't be like them. And they're thinking the same thing you're thinking. You know, we all seem to hear this voice that simply says, I can't be good enough. And I have really so many things to worry about. I know I'm going to get sick. I'm at the age where sickness is going to visit me. Um, life is going to upset me. It's going to turn me upside down. But then there's the voice that says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And then it turns and speaks directly to God and says, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Did I just hear the word worry? Oh, yeah. I want to tell you I'm good at worrying, and there's a lot of things to worry about. You know, there's the things that are going to happen. There's the things that might happen. There's things that won't happen. And I've got to worry about those. I've got a lot to worry about. I wish I could be safe. 
I really wish that my family wouldn't be turning on me, but they turn on me all the time. They're not good for me, and I have to I have to be on guard constantly. Um, the neighbors, I don't trust them. Oh, they'll be friendly to my face, but they're not really good for me. I yearn for more. Then there's a voice. You prepare a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Enemies are those people that are going to turn on us. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Then there's the voice that says, I wish I could be good enough for God. I just wish I could be good enough. I need to constantly find a way to be good because I'm called to be holy. And I can't be that good. Satan won't let me. There's compelling power that keeps me from being good enough as if being good enough could happen. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You know, I do enjoy church. I enjoy the sermons. I enjoy the singing. I enjoy the hope. I wish I really knew that I was going to be in heaven. You can't be really sure of that. You have to die to find out. The world would have us believe that we are meant to be insecure. Then there's the voice that says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It doesn't say, and I might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It just says, I will. Been listening to many voices lately. I believe it is critical that we affirm vocally, clearly, and strongly the voice that we hear. And I'm going to ask you to join me in doing that because we need to take a stand to rebuke Satan. He would have us believe the world. It's his message. And we rebuke Satan just like we rebuke, like Jesus rebuked him when he was taken off to temptation. We rebuke him with Scripture. And I'm going to ask you to join me in doing that right now. I'm going to ask that we read together this 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Ooh, through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. They run and they stay. They, they staff, they comfort me. You prepare place for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I just wonder... Did we read it with confidence or did we read it because we're familiar with it and we were asked to? Because I believe it's essential that we regularly confirm the voice we're listening to. We're going to hear these other voices. They're there. 
We can't get away from the message. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That message is going to be there. But that's not the voice we follow. We are not committed to that voice. We're committed to the voice of the Lord. David had really a lot of flaws. It wasn't easy to hold David up as a role model. He had more sins than we can talk about this morning. And yet he could say exactly what we just read and say, when it's over, that's me. He could, when we would say, the Lord is my shepherd, he would say, that's me. I shall not want. That's me. He leads me to lie down in green pastures. He restores me. He brings me beside still waters. And he'd say, that's me. On through that chapter. Whole purpose this morning was for us to consider for just a few minutes the voices we hear. And which voices are ours? The voices of doubt or the voices of certainty? The, do the voices that the world bombards us with or that quiet voice that we still have within us even in our darkest hours of what Christ is to us, what the message is to us from Scripture. If you had a little difficulty with being able to say, that's me, after we think about the 23rd Psalm, let's resolve this morning to not take that uncertainty home with us. Let's don't take uncertainty home. Let's take confidence home. Let's take confidence that the Lord is my shepherd and all that we read. If you're having difficulty with that confidence, I know there's a whole bunch of people here that want to help you do that. Maybe you've never started. Maybe you just need some help. Maybe you just want to share what's on your heart. I'm going to invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.